Um, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm, I'm John Moon. I'm a software engineer with uh, Qualcomm. I'm gonna talk to you about UAPI compatibility and how we can improve review. Yeah, so I'm kinda gonna go over the, the art of the possible, what's being done today and what we can do in the future. All right, so first high level overview, what is a UAPI? For the purposes of this talk, when, when we say UAPI, we mean any interface between kernel space and user space. So that's going to be your system calls, your UAPI headers that include dioctal structures, uh, sysfs, procfs, uh, even module parameters. There, there are other things, maybe debug fs, but we don't really consider that stable since it's debug. Uh, basically, anything in the kernel that could change and break a user space program is going to be a UAPI. And over on the right hand side, we have a, a struct that's used for, for an ioctal somewhere. And you can see in the bottom the, this comment that says, hey, we needed to change this to V2, so this one is deprecated. So likely, the kernel developer wanted to change the structure in some fundamental way, uh, but they couldn't change the structure because a user space program might be using it. So they had to create a new structure, V2, and move on from there. Uh, Linux famously does not break user space. Uh, I've, I've heard Greg refer to this as the Cambridge promise. Uh, so yeah, if uh, sometimes in, in Linux development, you'll go through and refactor things or uh, sometimes remove really old stuff that nobody's using. But if it does turn out later after you remove it that people complain, then that change needs to be reverted. And you, uh, yeah, you, you have to support it. We, we can't break UAPI. So today, to maintain UAPI compatibility, uh, as far as I can tell, this is this is what we're doing. We have code review. The maintainers get a patch. They, they look it over. OK, is this going to be, be breaking any user space? And then once it gets merged, it goes out to the whole testing universe for, for Linux. And if, uh, if any user space programs break there, then they can report it back upstream. And if it was indeed a breaking change, it'll get reverted. Uh, so what we're trying to bring to the table is some automated tooling to, to help with this process. So uh, what, do, what do we actually have? So <laughs> strange sound. Um, so, so today, we're, uh, we're trying to upstream this uh, shell script called checkuapi.sh. Uh, here, here's the lore link. Uh, please go check it out and comment and participate in the discussion. Welcome to, to criticism. Uh, this is the command line interface. It's it's fairly straightforward. You provide a base tree and some uh, Git reference in the past, and then the the basic business logic is to run make headers install on point A and point B and populate two parallel header trees, uh, and then we diff all of the headers in those trees. And it's not just a textual diff. We use uh, ABI diff, uh, which is a libabigail command line tool. So we, uh, for example, we have this, this structure over here, uh, struct foo. We added this new member z in between x and y. Uh, and ABI diff is going to report, hey, your, your offset of y changed and the size of the structure changed. So that, that's an incompatible change. Uh, in a lot of cases, ABI diff can be kind of overzealous when you're examining kernel code. So uh, like a very common pattern you see in kernel code is uh, having an enum that has uh, an underscore max variable at the end. Uh, and uh, by default, if you push this change into ABI diff, it'll complain about the color max uh, variant changing from two to three. Um, but with, uh, with suppressions, you can pass in certain kind of patterns, certain kinds of... Uh, 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 di different conditions for things that ABI diff can suppress. So in this case, we, we added this uh, regular expression match where, okay, if you have an, a changed enumerator variant that ends in underscore max, we don't really care about that. that that's fine. Uh, and shout out to Doji on the Live Abigail team. In the earlier revisions of this patch, we, we got a bunch of feedback that there were too many false positives. So we, we worked with Live Abigail upstream and tried to add additional suppressions to cover these corner cases. Uh, so now I'm going to go through a few examples to just kind of help get the ergonomics of how this script works. So here, here's a simple example. We just added a pound-defined foo to, to some header file. 
uh, that's not going to be a breaking change. So you you run the script and it goes through all 912 UAPI header files that get installed by make headers install. Uh, and I guess we'll get we'll get to it later why we have to check every single one. But uh, yeah, uh, one other thing to note: if you run the script with no arguments, it will um, well. If you have a dirty git tree, it will check your head against the dirty git tree. And if it's a clean tree, it'll check, check head against head minus one. Uh, so here's another example. We have a structure and we're changing the last member from a signed 32 bit int to an unsigned 32 bit int. Uh, you run the script, it's it's gonna complain about this. So it the, stru the size of the structure hasn't changed, so your IOCTL code's not going to change, but um, it is potentially possible. Maybe you have a user space program that was passing in, in a negative number or something. There, there could be some uh, incompatibility potentially, so the script does report it. Uh, but if you pass the dash I parameter, then it's going to say uh, it's going to ignore ambiguous changes. So it is possible that um, it is possible that a kernel space driver was uh, processing the it, it, it's possible that this was a compatible change so if uh, if it's impossible for user space to pass in a, a negative number for one reason or another then we, we can ignore this um, here's here's another example we move a destination register uh, below source register so we're just moving a struct member uh, in this case, what, what do you guys think? Is, is this going to be a breaking change? Yeah. So even if you pass the dash I flag here, that's going to be flagged as, as a breaking change. Any user space program using uh, either of those is going gonna, is gonna to break. Uh, so here, we're making a change to an ARM64 header. We're adding a, a new variable to the end of the structure. And if I run the script, we see, hey, there were no changes to UAPI headers. Now, the reason I have this is I'm running on an x86 machine. So when I run uh, make headers install, the parallel trees don't include the ARM64 headers. Uh, but if you pass in a cross compiler and set the arch variable, then it will install make headers install correctly and uh, go, go check those headers. Uh, one other thing to note here is uh, 884 headers were checked now instead of the 912. Uh, they're just fewer headers for ARM64. Uh, so now, in general, uh, you can also pass dash i here, and it doesn't report it as a breaking change. So adding a new variable to the end of the structure does change the size of the struct, uh, but it is technically possible to handle this kind of expansion in kernel space. Um, you can map your ioctals correctly to, to go to the same command. And if you use copy struct from user and IOC size, then uh, and then the kernel will automatically zero extend your structure or truncate your structure to deal with the disagreement in the size. So if your kernel driver is able to see that new variable and know if it's set to zero, that means user space didn't have this notion of new variable, then it, it can be okay. So in this case, we, we treat it as an ambiguously breaking change. I'm, I'm open to feedback about that. But. In, in this case, uh, SIG context can likely get embedded in U context, and then it gets embedded in interpreters for signal handling. Mm. So it's not safe to make these changes. So, But it, it's context dependent in user space whether or not these things are safe or not. So if you, I guess you can't pass dash I every time, right? So you have to mm. know what's going on in this case. OK. So it, yeah. it, it usually the biggest case is like, uh, I think we broke this on S390 at one point in user space, uh, and it breaks a per, uh, Perl interpreter and like a Python interpreter because they have a mm. struct inside of a struct. And so it's no lo it matters how big the thing is at this point, mm. and you can't change them. There's a lot of user space yeah. structs that you can't change. Yeah. So the struct inside the struct will be called out as a non -induced. No, but it's, it's, oh, it's, it's a struct in the kernel space, but in user space, you stick it inside another struct. Oh. Uh. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Can't control that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Yeah, I, I I'd say like the the interesting point to consider is here that the kernel is like a library at this point. UAPI mm -hmm. is like a lib UAPI if you want to call it, and so then you have to consider all the use cases of where it can be put, 
And I think the, the other thing that's going to show up here if we get to it at some point is uh, how do you define uh, macro values? Are they enumerations or not? If those things get included into C++ programs, then those C++ programs uh, can, it can change the name mangling of yeah. that thing in a C++ program. Hmm. And so whether it's an enum or a macro matters, whether it's assigned or unsigned matters, because that changes uh, name mangling. And so while UAPI is all C, it can get included in C++, it can get included in Rust, it can get included mm. in WASM in theory, like all the language runtimes suck in basically what is effectively lib UAPI, so. Interesting. All right, yeah, thank you. We can discuss that more. So for the multi art stuff, like I, I know the kernel for some reason years ago took away the, the full all headers install target that was there. Mm. Um, and so like we're using scripts now to generate our kernel headers package and uh, for all headers, but we can do that without having to pass uh, a cross compiler. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and so I'm kind of wondering, like, maybe we could make this script where it checks all arches and doesn't require a cross compiler to do that. Yeah. So, so the issue there is we are actually compiling the the header. So, so basically, what we're doing okay. to because ABI diff operates on binary files. Right. Right. So, to to do that to generate the binary file with the dwarf necessary to to That's have fair. ABI okay. diff process it. Yeah. So we basically pass in a, a dummy C file that just has you know, return zero and then. Yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, you need the cross compiler because, um, so Doji is on my team at Red Hat, but um, you can't check the headers by themselves. You actually have to try to use the things in the headers to then get a binary artifact that you can then compare and check because the headers need to be processed that so you need to go through that whole step. So you need a cross compiler to do all this. And so if you do all the headers install, you need all the cross compilers, which is OK. It's just up to however you want to deploy the script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so like in our, our case, if we're you know checking an ARM64 target build for, for that kernel, then, then we'll do the UAPI checker script for, for that. And, and just for some context, at, at Qualcomm, we are using this as part of our CI process for, for changes coming in. So. Um, yeah, if, if if something comes into kernel platform, we we run the UAPI checker and we can go yell at people if they break. Okay. Uh, right. So here's uh, here's another example: uh, changing a, a type in types.h. Uh, so changing poll t underscore t to unsigned short. Uh, in this case, you you run it and it flags something in uh, event poll.h. And it's, this is kind of notable because that's not the header file you modified. So this, this is another reason that we have to go check every single header file in the tree, uh, not just the ones you modified. Uh, they, they can cross depend on each other. Uh, and you can see here the script also says, hey, I noticed this, this .h file didn't change between the revs, uh, but maybe one of these includes did because something broke. Um, and another reason is you can have a change like this. Uh, so if you comment out the terminus.h from kbuild, then it doesn't get installed by make headers install, and uh, boom, the header's gone and you've, you've broken somebody. So uh, yeah, it'll report any UAPI removals as well. Uh, you can check uh, large swaths of history by passing in a dash b and dash p. So you can look between you know, 6.1, 6.0 in this example. Um, and I'm, I'm not printing everything here, but the, the script does flag 37 things as, as breaking between those tags. And one thing to note here is the script has no understanding of your intention with your changes. So like I said earlier, the kernel does go and refactor things. The kernel does go uh, delete unused interfaces and, and that's perfectly valid, but the, the script doesn't understand that. Uh, so I guess before we move on to the next script, any other general questions about uh, the script? A common pattern in UAPI will be adding padding at the end of a struct of mm -hmm. a different type. And then as you need to extend it, you will remove the padding and replace it with variables of, of concrete types that you need. What would happen with the script? Yeah. Would it so in our earlier revisions, those those issues got flagged. But we did work with uh, Doji and the Lib Abigail team and added a new suppression for that kind of situation. So uh, in the latest revision of the script, we have basically a big list of regular expressions. And we say, if you're expanding into any of these named fields, then we consider it a safe change. So it's like padding, reserved, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, I just mentioned that the suppression in Lib Abigail is even extensive enough that like 
So in libc, we have some structs which like the first X number of bits are public and the residual number of bits are like private. So mm. for example, the link map structure has some fields that users can rely on and some fields that they can't. And while the checker can look at, can see the definition of all of those, you know, uh, you can have suppression lists that are even as complex as like these things don't matter if they change past this number of bits. Mm. So, but I don't, I can't come up with any examples in my head that are that case in UAPI. I think everything yeah. that we expose is is the user can see it, and if it's defined in the header, then, then they can access it. Okay. Uh, one other thing that I was wondering about is is uh, uh, you were saying that there's there's 37 differences between uh, 6.1 and 6.0, and and that uh, some of them are intentional or, or at least uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, they're breakages, but it doesn't matter. It sounds to me almost like uh, if this is adopted more widely, that it that labeling whether or not something was intentional or not might be a good idea so that this mm. could be used more long term. And I, I don't mean uh, with your tool, but actually in the source code where people could basically say this, we intentionally have changed the UA API for these reasons that you could then consume. Of course, that's a, a bigger piece for the for the kernel community. Say again, sorry? No, then you can't do it. That's true. That's true. I mean, yeah, you can you can put it in the commit message, so it's still there for posterity, and there's a way yeah, to verify. It, yeah, yeah. The, the point it, is, is that as long as that's marked, that could be kind of interesting. Sorry. Uh, we could. Can have you talked to the K build people that Zero Day bought at Intel? I have not. I feel like that would be yeah. the right way to do it. They generally report things once, and that's how I do stuff. Like I, I consider one report, and then if you fix it, good. If it's not, it's it's like you've seen your report. Um, normally, people fix things, so we're pretty good about that. Try not to nag you about stuff, which is a false positive, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's this is generally useful as kind of a tip off to a reviewer, not necessarily the end all be all of what is compatible. Right. So that's that's kind of how we're using it internally. And uh, how will the script handle implicit padding added by, by the compiler of the struct is, for instance, 46 bit aligned and you have a, a 30 bit uh, variable at the end, field at the end of the struct, and then you have another 32 bits of padding. If you add something in that mm -hmm. padding, which uh, what, what, does, does the script even, even handle it? Or? Yeah, so um, I, I believe ABI diff in that case, if the size of the structure doesn't actually change, then it doesn't report it as a, an, an incompatible change. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if the size does change, if you happen to go over the pat padding boundary, then it would. Yeah, but does that it, sense? it can be uh, incompatible between on different architectures, like if, if, the, if the alignment or... Uh, yeah, it would check with whatever you're compiling oh, with. Okay. Yeah. As you say, um, uh, Lib Abigail is working on the dwarf data for the compiled uh, test application that basically uses the headers. And so if that changes in a way that's observable by the program, then it's an ABI issue. The oh, uh, Abigail, somebody talked to what it is exactly? Yeah, I guess you're on the team. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so uh, Abigail is a uh, ABI uh, serialization analysis library. Um, and uh, we implemented it ourselves because in uh, Fedora and in RHEL, uh, Abigail gets used as part of passes for inspecting the ABI artifacts of built packages and, uh, and whether or not those ABI artifacts are changing. So for example, for glibc, uh, we have a public statement for uh, an application compatibility guideline for RHEL. And um, uh, level one applications are ABI stable across uh, three major releases of the OS. And so we use libabigail to do uh, kind of look at ABI artifacts and how they're evolving between, let's say, like RHEL 7, RHEL 8, and RHEL 9. You should be able to take a RHEL 7 application and run in a RHEL 9. So this is a great use of like ABI serialization and analysis to to then decide between these releases how how are things going. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, if you look up uh, Lib Abigail in Google, it'll should pull up the the project. Yeah. Okay. I work in safety critical environments, mm -hmm. um, and big huge can of worms that you didn't intend to get into. But developer author intent is a big issue having meta information associated with that, being able to understand what the intent of the author was in a parsable way, like SPDX, is hugely important. We mm. can't fly things in 
uh, what you call level A critical situation, high hazardous situations, because the Linux kernel doesn't have actual design and architecture associated with it. I have to show the FAA design and architecture, and I can't do that. There's yeah. too many lines of code. So um, Kate and I were just talking about that. We do need some sort of meta information associated with, um, ideally, maybe even a standard, I don't know, associated with author intent and design level requirements pushing down. It's exactly what we said. I don't know the right answer to that question. There isn't an answer. We want we want to put we want to put Linux in places where it doesn't exist right now. So, so I mean, you're free to use Linux for whatever you want, but you're not free to tell us how to create Linux. <laughs> and you're not, and we can't impose additional restrictions on our already overworked maintainers to meet an arbitrary single single government requirement. Not at all. What it has to be, it has to be. <laughs> I agree with you completely. And anything that has to be, anything that's done has to improve the workflow for everybody. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who is well versed now, unfortunately, in different governmental regulations in the different parts of the world, there are conflicting requirements and and uses to find something that's going to work for everybody i mean you're going to tell the country of taiwan that yeah, yeah you know what i mean it's, it's, <laughs> 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 anyway so Sorry. but that, but that is independent of this so i mean uapi changes are wonderful because we don't want to break them and we remove them but that has i mean we can intentionally do that but that is not a functional a functional right. of the code you uh, api is not a function Function, how things work. Yeah, but um, from the API perspective, if we can basically have more visibility as to the intent behind the APIs and have that documented so people don't keep getting asked and asked and asked, we actually have a path forward here. Okay, so we do have documentation ABI, <laughs> and we have tools that check, which nobody seems to run, if we are, <laughs> when we do add new APIs, that they are actually documented there. So okay. if, if a group were wishing to document everything, you can run the tool today, see all the holes, and start documenting. We'll never turn down that documentation. Um, so we have the tools. We, there's, there's tools already in the kernel for that. So there's tools in the kernel to check the API of an of a installed system to see if it's all documented or not. Yeah, I actually User. get to some of that. In okay, a bit cool. Here. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a great tool. <laughs> but I mean, that's independent of changes. Like this is, you're checking structure sizes here, which is a different instance. Mm -hmm. One second. Yeah, Nick. Uh, thanks for the stats. Even just between two releases of Linux, like 37 is much higher than I would have expected. That, yeah. that zero of those are a problem for any user is surprising to me. But I think that what they're talking about here is if you refactor, like we do this all the time in Lipsy mm -hmm. as well, you move, you, you break structs out, you put them into their own headers, you then reorganize, and you're yeah. constantly cleaning. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, you're constantly cleaning the headers. So maybe to Kate's point and the Chuck. Chuck's point is that like um, often what you want is a change, a commit that also adjusts the suppression list it's a little dangerous because it's no, but it's dangerous because it's it's a closed loop change. And so if you make a mistake in both places, you don't detect the ABI issue. Hmm. Um, and, but you do, but intent can be documented in some way that if you, if, if you have a, if you have a second suppression list, if you have a suppression list and you're able to check the suppression list yeah. and then you just make sure that the, the change matches or you, you, you describe some way why it's ABI compatible, but again, that's, it is extra work and mm -hmm. people do have to agree that that work has value. Yeah. So I think it's valuable as a Libsy author, right? Because <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm on, I'm, I, every day I'm just git pull and I build new headers and I build new Libsy against the new headers and I'm constantly looking for breakage in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and UAPI is what I'm always looking at because it's what we need to use in, in user space. Yeah. And I'm curious, do you have data across multiple Linux releases, like a histogram of like, 
37 this time, but how about the next time? How many were there? Yeah, like, I, I don't have that today, but it'd be easy I'm, to generate. I'm almost yeah. picturing like, uh, it, it would be nice if we had some metadata file or something that said like, for each breakage this tool identifies, has someone looked into, mm -hmm. is it problematic or not? Mm -hmm. And then the, that's something that, that, the, that the script uses to um, suppress things. So you're not yeah. suppressing every dash I, because some are bad and some are not bad. Mm -hmm. So instead you have a way of breaking out Oh well, when this field changed in this struct, it's okay, and the tool suppresses that in the future. Hmm. But if there's you know a thousand UAPI breakages a week, it's not sustainable to maintain that kind of metadata. Right. If there's few, which hopefully there are, maybe yeah. it is more sustainable to have a list where people have signed off on each one, yeah. either saying, "Oops," or "Nothing to see here." Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? No, oh, great. Um, yeah, and, and please do. Uh, th there's a link to the slides on the presentation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please please do follow the links in there and uh, participate in the in the patch, and we can get discussion going there too. Uh, so, in the same patch set, there's also this uh, script check module params. Uh, this it has a very similar command line interface. Uh, the logic is much much simpler. All it does is essentially grep for module param dot star and then looks at your args and if anything changes, it'll flag it. And that's that's really all it does. So it's it's helpful to have in our CI system as well for you know inexperienced developers who might be changing something inadvertently. Uh, but yeah, not not uh, not very impressive. Uh, so now this uh, comes up to sysfs and procfs compatibility, and. For this, we don't really have any tooling. We don't have an answer to this, this problem. Uh, so part of the reason I'm here giving this talk is to solicit feedback from all of you experts about what we can do about SysFS and ProcFS. Because uh, basically today, we, we have read and write from, from these files, and that's the interface. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to, to break user space by changing your SysFS or ProcFS files. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm open to more, more discussion here. Uh, if we, uh, just to kind of get the juices flowing, as Greg was saying, we already have sysfs and procfs files in documentation slash ABI. And there's already a Perl script that can go in there and parse all of that documentation. Good example. Is it? <laughs> uh, well, Richard Purdy is, is a part of the Octo project and, and open embedded. So oh, I, I picked it at random, so I'm glad it's good. Uh, sure, it's random. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, get abi.perl, it, it has the ability to look through your documentation directory and uh, it'll look through your running sysfs nodes. And if it sees any sysfs nodes that aren't uh, documented, it'll say, hey, go document these. So we kind of ha already have a little bit of machining here. Uh, so I was wondering maybe this could be extended and have something kind of similar to like device tree bindings. So if the documentation in there kind of becomes the the API to SysFS and ProcFS, maybe we could write some automated tooling that could, uh, it could generate test stubs, it could uh, potentially perform static analysis. I, I don't know, this isn't a very fully baked idea. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. So I don't know, uh, what, what, do, what do folks think about the SysFS and ProcFS compatibility? Uh, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> you put your laptop down there. <laughs> pay attention. I mean, SysFS's goal is you can, if a file is not there anymore, that's not a break. That's why it's one value per file. So in proc, we had the problem of fields that you had to parse out of a static file. So SysFS goal was to, if the file isn't present, that means your user space code better handle that and move on. Hmm. So removing or adding a SysFS file is not a breakage. It's actually by design. Okay. Um, now the trick is the, what does that file contain? Yeah. <laughs> and people argue about that all the time. Right? Yeah. And if I write a, a one or a two to that file, what does that mean? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we have, the, yeah, we have the document. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it'll go back to the we don't break uh, the a API if you notice. <laughs> so, no, literally, that's 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 yeah. the rule. And then if you notice, we work around it. And sometimes we do the okay, we will change this in four years because we change user space today. Mm -hmm. We know now we can change it in four years because nobody will notice anymore. 
And that's a valid way to do it. So it will show up as, oh, this is a breaking change, but we know because user space can handle it. Yeah. So encoding that is hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Say, uh, checking for breakage in procfs, of course, is also hard because the files themselves can change. So what's in it, the format, yeah, so it's, that's, that's what we said. yeah, no, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah, no, exactly. So people keep wanting to add things to the <laughs> Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. But I mean, you do, you do have, the the uh, Torsten's doing the regression stuff upstream too, right? So mm -hmm. we, we push stuff up. Obviously, we'd rather it not get out to users. But when it does get out to users, um, a lot of those regressions now are being tracked, being tracked well, and being handled by that project. So yeah, right, things get reverted. We're seeing it. It's just you know, I, it's it's not the ultimate solution, but at least it's helping. Yeah, and and testing is you know a great way to catch a lot of these issues. Um, yeah, we're just trying to find an answer that can help maybe before it gets out there. Yeah. Okay, we've got somebody I think on the stream. Rob, do you do you have a question? You might have to unmute. They are unmuted. No, he may be heard or muted on his mic or something. We can't hear him. I can see if. Oh yeah, would it be going blue on the? I'm not sure. I have a random cluster. Yeah, can you ask your question in chat? Is that okay? We can't. We can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Technology is hard. It is. <laughs> Just always asking the question. Anybody else have something they want to add? Yep. I'm sorry. So, if I'm building a Linux distribution, how often should I be running this sort of tooling? Hmm. Every time you upgrade your kernel, I would guess every day, every day. Bruce. <laughs> yeah. I, I, okay. I mean, that's that's a fair answer because I I knew you'd you'd mentioned that there as well, but I'm I'm just curious. Yeah. You know how closely you should watch for ABI changes. Um, yeah. And I, mean, I can certainly see them sliding in funny ways. Yeah. Knowing what I know about how people build Linux yeah. distributions. And I'm not, I'm not sure about your process. We we run this on every patch as it comes in to, to our kernel. But if you're a distro, distro maintainer, yeah, I would agree. Probably every time you upgrade your kernel, you could you could check the the sources there. I was going to say the same thing. I think I channeled Don Zickis here for the rail kernel team as well, which is every time you you've got you've got pre commit CI that should be running this to give you a, a yellow. A green, yellow, or red, mm -hmm. right? Depending. I, I didn't see you have any warnings, but there are mm -hmm. there are ambiguous, which can end up in a warning category for someone to review versus red, which is like you definitely know it was a an ABI issue. Yeah, that's true. Maybe we can change it so that it's like a warning condition yeah, instead of just success warn fail and, and like yeah. warn someone should inspect it. But um, yeah, so I'd say every time you build a binary artifact, there's either gating CI or before you get to that uh, pre commit CI would. I'd say you, you'd want to run this. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, Rob actually just uh, posted here. He said, I um, just want to say I was, he was thinking the same, the same thing for SysFS stocks. Uh, Rob also saying he uh, JSON schema is, is kind of his the hammer he uses now for this. And uh, Yano, uh, I'm going to mangle your name. I'm sorry. Uh, Giuliano, yeah. there we go, uh, is saying, um, yeah, inter a enum max changes should be considered breaking. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Hmm. Yeah? Yes yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it's there for, right? To... Yeah. Yes, it's, it is a breakage if user space used it. No, it has to be there because the kernel needs it. Right. And we can't split unless we define it. We, we just C requires you to put it in the same spot. That's the hard part. Yeah, yeah. Kernel needs to know the max. It's a mess. Yeah. OK, that's an interesting edge case. I'm sure there are a lot of different user space edge cases that we're not considering here. So yeah, happy to hear any anything that should be flagged and isn't. Yeah. As, as far as what, how often this should be built uh, run in a build system, I'm not uh, entirely sure that uh, that, that people are going to run this on every single uh, build of, of, say, a Yocto project build if the kernel hasn't changed, for instance. Uh, in, in some cases, people will wipe out their entire build and start over again 
ch checking the uh, UAPI changes on every single build is, I can imagine, is something that, that not everyone would want to do every time. Uh, although I agree that it would probably not be a bad thing to do. But uh, if you're making changes to the kernel, absolutely. Yeah, for, for some context, the, on an eight core machine, this that takes about 15, 20 seconds to run. Yeah, that, that was just the question. Oh. What, how much is the impact? <laughs> Because, yeah. because if I if I burn like ten minutes on compiling the kernel and right. it's ten microseconds, then I'm gonna be like, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it, it checks them in parallel, so more cores help. But yeah. okay, uh, it says, or you can stop your users using arbitrary things in the UAPI. I'm not sure how you can do that, but hmm. yeah, that that is trickier. Uh, yeah, down so here. You can stop your users using arbitrary things in the UAPI. Oh, mine doesn't. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure you can. <laughs> no, it says you can't. You can't. I'm sorry. You can't. I'm sorry. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's an opposite. Yeah. Great. Right. When we know we're going to break the API, we search the Debian code search to see if it's actually used or not. And we use that as our <laughs> reference to see if this is going to be okay or not. So that's how we do it like i've been yeah. changing a lot for the serial ports and stuff like that we're seeing what is actually being used and, and when we drop protocols and when we drop other stuff yeah so that's the best that's the best we can do because we can't see all the clothes but debian is the world so <laughs> yeah. I mean, it has the world contained in it everybody else is a subset of Debian. So. yeah Four minutes left, and uh, any, any last parting shots or things that people want to add? Maybe this is totally unrelated, but I just this um, metadata stuff. I was just wondering, and I don't know enough about the CSF internals, but any sense of possibly using extended attributes to just put up metadata about each file that's there so that you could possibly have version number six you can extract straight from CSFS and probably even generate that, um, you know, part of a kernel artifacts. Yeah. We do not allow help files within the kernel. Okay. <laughs> it comes up a lot. Yeah. It's like you read this file and it's going to tell you what it described. Now okay. we don't. What we do, there are some CSFS that do have, this is going to be one of four options. Okay. And it shows the four options and shows the current selected one. But other than that, we don't want to do extended attributes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Has a, a question, I think. He's raised his hand on the, on the talk. Oh, uh, yeah. I... yeah. Do you want to come on camera and ask your question? Yeah. Oh. He's trying to connect. Yeah, I heard. Seems like having some audio, <laughs> audio problems. Uh, again, if you want to put that into your into the chat. Oh, here we go. One second. Oh, uh, does it make sense to show a commit hash to that introduce the breakage? Um, just an idea. So, um. You may need to run git blame to just the, detect the commit hash. Because we need to um, check the commit log that, that this is just just a breakage or just something in, intentional change. Or... Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 You bisect the breakage? Can you bisect the breakage? Um, uh, no, not bisect. Yeah, git blame because some you change yeah. this field in the struct, then probably you you may want to check the commit uh, commit message just why mm. this field was changed. So just just idea. So it might be yeah. useful so, so just to show the commit. Generally, you could. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, Masahiro is right. If if you know while I was developing this, if I find something in between two long swaths, I'll, I'll do a git blame on the changed file and try to figure it out that way. That's generally pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. Perfect. Yeah, just that idea. The, yeah. the, this is really good. I mean, I, I really like what I'm seeing here. I, I would say one of the things you're probably hearing, um, maybe mostly from me, but. This is a heur heur heuristic at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and there is a desire to see similar levels of 
compatibility assurance in a lot of different open source projects as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, definitely keep going, but I think there is a larger need here uh, that, that is not being addressed. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, that's actually uh, time. So uh, thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you very much, thank John. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, great uh, things. It sounds like we've got a lot of uh, interesting ideas and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, other, come, other stuff. Come find me in the hallways and we that's can right. discuss more. So I, I guess we have to all influence in our build systems by next year. <laughs> <laughs>